Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Board of Education, my name is Andy Culp, the superintendent of Grandview Heights. Wanted to kick off tonight's second Grandview Heights Athletic Master Planning Committee, our community meeting. Uh, tonight, there are really two core goals. The first is to share the collective work of the two full days that the Master Planning Committee, um, the outcomes realized of those two full days uh, today, along with some updates on, uh, I believe there are five options, so we'll share those. And then lastly, garner community feedback. Um, I guess because there aren't that many people present at, here, at tonight's uh, community meeting. If you are watching this video and decide or would like to email me directly at andy.culp at ghschools.org, please feel free to do so or Brad Bertani um, as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Amy Ekman, project manager with Perkins and Will. So tonight we're going to go over uh, uh, the same presentation that we went over today with our workshop group. So you'll see the same content. Um, and then again with the feedback, you're welcome to reach out to Andy and Brad with any feedback. And we are going to offer some optional site tours at some point. Those dates are to be determined. And our next meeting will be July 19th. So uh, we'll just start off with a little bit of a recap of what we talked about last time. Um, we have this decision-making uh, chart up here where we talk about all the folks who are involved and who inform and recommend and decide. So the informing groups are the workshop committee we met with today, uh, the folks here at this community meeting. Uh, we'll have user group focus groups as well and of course the design team that's working on the project. Uh, that group will recommend uh, to the district core team which is made up of uh, Member of focused uh, people that are um, a part of the steering kind of committee for this process and that group will, will recommend to the Board of Education um, who will be the final decision maker. Again our next community meeting is July 19th here at 6 p.m. Uh, for, for those who joined us last time, we showed this chart of our workshop committee meetings and how those tie into these community meetings. Uh, we had our last one in May, uh, and then today, of course, was our master planning focused one where we took all the information from our first visioning session and applied that to actual plans. Um, and then, uh, of course, this community meeting tonight, we'll give the board an update uh, between now and the next meeting, and then um, have that final master planning meeting where we will have associated budgets with the options that we derive. Um, and then again, a final board approval after that. Okay. So what we did the first workshop, which makes up the master plan, or we did a facilities condition assessment of the physical facility conditions to get a baseline understanding of what the um, conditions are. What we did today are some uh, options analysis and, and programmatic analysis of the, the spaces that need to be included and the site elements that need to be included. And that third layer, the budget analysis, will come in again at that last workshop. So I'll introduce Corey Nissenberg, a project architect at Perkins Well. Thank you. So just as a recap of what we presented at the last community meeting and also what we had talked about in the first workshop, this is a diagram of the assessment that was done by the architecture team as well as our engineers uh, on the site walked through the buildings and really took a, a view of what's on the site today. So as you can see on this diagram, the site areas are split up amongst red, yellow, and green uh, colors. And these colors, uh, as you can see, they reflect immediate, short-term, uh, medium-term and long-term uh, work that needs to be done. So you'll see this red, yellow, green color scheme reflected in some costs as well later, but this concept is what we wanted to break down the site into to allow us to look at what needs to be targeted, what work needs to be targeted sooner versus maybe five years down the road and then 10 plus years down the road after that. 
So just to recap some of the things that were talked about in the first workshop, the restrooms and locker rooms being below standards, equitable facilities, the track configuration not allowing for a common finish line, limited accessibility on the site, community access, uh, parking during events, baseball, outfield fencing, the, the temporary fencing that's there in the outfield, as well as the size of the backstop and the safety concerns for foul balls. Uh, and then also the tennis courts were talked about and the number of courts that are uh, at some of the offsite facilities. And then while talking about those things in the previous workshop, these guiding principles came out of the conversations, which really set the stage for the conversations that were had today, uh, as well as moving forward for uh, the master plan for the site. And those are the inclusivity and equity in the design. So that'll be accessibility, as well as Title IX. Uh, security and safety, there's a, a lot of talk about uh, the, the fencing around the site, how this space is used, uh, at night, how the, the, the um, access to the park will be allowed. Um, efficient use of the space, this is a very tight site, so how do we efficiently use the, the site, uh, provide the fields, the buildings in there, and um, have everything function as efficiently as possible. The aesthetics, so a lot of, there was a lot of talk about tradition and the elements that are on site now and how does that then translate to what will happen in the future. And then just quality over quantity, providing a space that's easily maintained and sustainable moving forward. Uh, so I'll pass this over to Steve Turks. Hello, uh, welcome this evening. Uh, one of the things that we gathered at the first workshop were any number of programmatic uh, elements for the new for the uh, athletic complex. When I say programmatic elements, what I'm talking about are things like locker rooms. What are the needs around locker rooms? What are the needs around field sports? And so all that has been captured in a spreadsheet form. And we worked with that today. The group did to um, to decipher that to make sure that those uh, that we actually captured accurate information. Uh, with some of the some of the outcomes from today, uh, uh, the workshop that took place uh, this morning and this afternoon, really were to, to were to confirm those programmatic needs, and then take a look at the planning options, which we're going to share in a few moments, and give us some input and feedback on those. Uh, Corey just talked about the assessments that were done, and one of the other things that we did earlier today was share some cost information, which Doug Addis from Concord Addis. Uh, the firm that is doing the cost consulting and the owner's rep for the uh, for, for Grandview. Uh, they put some cost information together, but really the, the, the intent of, of this image is just to share that the costs that are being shared will always be total project costs. In other words, uh, if the project comes to fruition, the monies that would get paid to contractors, but then all the other associated costs, which in our industry we call soft costs, so this could be things like architects and engineering fees, uh, testing during construction, uh, or FF&E, all sorts of uh, other items that make up the total picture, the total cost picture for the project. Um, so the costs that have been developed so far, we would consider baseline cost. In other words, what I mean by that is for the for the uh, the the the, build, the elements that are on the site today, what is the cost uh, to uh, repair uh, those items that are there? So. If your roof needs to be replaced, for instance, what's the cost of that? A track is the, the track is a great example. It actually does need to be replaced, and so not trying to make it anything other than it is, but replace the track surface and the and the underlayment below the track. And then there there are a couple of other categories as we move into the options, and those are where we would be renovating spaces to enhance them for uh, necessary and needed program elements. So either renovating or rebuilding. Uh, both of those things are captured in the options that we'll share. Relative to the costs, uh, we have broken it down into three buckets, uh, zero to five year needs, and again, these are costs just to maintain or fix what is there. Zero to five years, uh, five to 10, and then 10 plus. And what you're seeing on the, in the pie chart here is 
Uh, there's any number of issues on, on the current uh, athletic complex site that need more immediate uh, needs uh, and repairs than longer term. In fact, it goes down quite a bit in that 10 plus year uh, category. And with that, I'm gonna invite Doug Addis to come up to share some cost information. Thank you. Yeah. So, so to uh, Steve's point, uh, all the numbers that you see on this slide are, are fully loaded, meaning that uh, the hard construction costs, soft construction costs, hard construction cost side, we have general conditions, general, general requirements, and the fee for the CM. On the soft cost side, we have items like uh, design fees, athletic equipment, IT, security, FF&E, specialty consultant, project management consultant, and uh, owner contingency as well. So the numbers that you see here, and to Steve's point, are zero to five years, five to 10, and 10 years plus that uh, total of 7.4 million are fully loaded uh, with everything in those numbers. Thank you, Doug. And what's, one of the things that's important about understanding these numbers, which again, we consider baseline costs, is that um, really don't want to leave any misperception as we start looking at options that to kind of do nothing, if you will, is a zero cost choice. There's always costs associated with existing facilities and especially with facilities that are of the age that those are. Uh, this is just showing in a little bit more detail the programmatic elements that we looked at today. I want to jump right into the options. Uh, the options will stair step up uh, from lower cost, less invasive to higher cost, more invasive. There are, you're going to see five images on the screen. There are really four options. Option two has a 2A and 2B, and there's one sort of nuanced difference uh, between those two, which I'll explain. So uh, there's a lot of information on uh, on the slides. Uh, I would encourage those of you at home to, uh, if you'd like, uh, you can always look at this presentation and hit pause and study study all of the text. I probably don't have time this evening to talk about every single bit of text that's on the slide, but I'm gonna give you the general overview, the big picture for each one of the options. So uh, option one, I'll always start here uh, on, the, on the right side of the screen and I'll work my way across it to the left uh, to get you oriented, north is to the left on the screen. What you're seeing over here to the right side of the screen is the high school building, okay? Directly across uh, uh, West Third is the athletic complex that really the, the, uh, the parcel that is the subject of the master plan study. So what this option is showing is as we work our way again from south to north, left, uh, right to left, is a, a new sort of ceremonial entry uh, to the athletic complex right off of third. This keeps the existing stadium as it is, but does a renovation of locker space below it and other spaces below. It keeps the track, uh, uh, it actually, I'm sorry, replaces the track and every scheme is, is also addressing a needed fix to the straightaway. Currently, the, the straightaway extends off here to the south, which means uh, when uh, it's not a common uh, of, uh, finish line, which is a problem for uh, the track events. So it's always bringing what's called the spur, that little piece that sticks off the kind of tail, and moving it to the north. So this does that, but it replaces the track where it sets, with the exception of that, of that spur that I mentioned. Uh, it is doing an expansion of the concessions building. Currently, as it says today, the concessions building is tight. Uh, if you've ever looked through the, uh, through the openings and bought something there, it's tight. It is not, is not, does not meet ADA accessibility. And there's also some, some uh, storage for concessions that is in a small uh, shed uh, about 20 feet away from the building. So it consolidates all that, makes the building a bit bigger, and to, and to also make it accessible. So, that's what this element is. I mentioned the existing track. We're hanging on to uh, the maintenance building, the, what's called the coal board building. will stay, uh, it'll be uh, uh, fixed and the, the things, this deficiencies will be fixed, but it stays as is. And then um, add a new section of building for added locker rooms. 
So one of the things that you'll find between all the schemes, the programmatic elements, in other words, those things that are contained within the buildings is addressed in every single one of the options. It's addressed differently, but it's addressed. So the building footprint is very similar from scheme to scheme. The thing that will be, one of the things that will be different is how play fields are, are handled. Uh, some, some schemes you'll see you're, you're going to introduce softball or tennis onto the site and so forth. Uh, in this scheme, the, uh, the, the field, the turf field stays where it is, but the, uh, in the replacement of the track, the, these what are called the D-rings, these ends of the end, basically beyond the end zones at the football field, become a synthetic uh, surface similar to the track that allow other field sports, long jump, uh, pole vault, and high jump to occur uh, in a better way. Uh, visitor bleachers stay where they are. Uh, there is, if you're familiar with this site, there's what is called the upper field, and it's called the upper field because it's about six feet up higher in elevation than the, than the track. Uh, all these schemes are dealing with that gray change, e either with a building or a retaining wall, uh, trying to create some more flat level space to allow some other uh, functions to happen, and an understanding that we need to be able to get people from that lower field to the upper field in a, an accessible way, something that meets ADA. Uh, a new uh, visitor's concession and visitor's toilets on that side of the stadium as well as just adjacent to it, to its left or to the north, a consolidated cell tower building, which brings together, there are maybe three or four different locations where there is ground equipment for the cell towers that currently occupy three of the four uh, light towers uh, that light the stadium. Where, uh, there's some conversations happening with a company to consolidate those into one building and bring the cell tower service, uh, the stuff that's up in the air, onto one monopole. Uh, that lets us do some other things with the site. Uh, some track and field events, uh, uh, the uh, discus and the shot put, and then the, in this game, option one, is brings the uh, baseball field a little bit uh, uh, south and west so to, get, to increase the distance from home plate to the backstop. Currently, it's about 20 or 25 feet, which is really subpar. Ideally for high school, <clears throat> excuse me, you'd be at 60 feet, but we've set uh, 40 feet as sort of the target for this project, understanding that uh, east to west, uh, uh, we'd be compromising the, uh, the foul line if we could did much more than 40 feet uh, to, from home plate to backstop. So that's a pretty common dimension that you'll see in all of the schemes. Okay, that's option one. Option two now takes it a step further. Option two introduces, uh, still has a sort of ceremonial entry from the high school. It uh, now introduces, instead of a six lane track, an eight lane track. In doing so, uh, those two added lanes happen to the outboard side of the track so as to not reduce the turf field interior of the track. And which also means that the visitor bleachers now become not permanent bleachers, but temporary that can be moved on and off the track for games or field sports that are happening on the track. Uh, a new concessions area, not, ex not an expanded existing, but new concessions area that has a few other things in it, restrooms, ticketing, storage, uh, and so forth. <clears throat> new home site bleachers, so this is replacing the existing concrete stadium with a new uh, stadium. And it's open air beneath that in this option. It adds a new building to the north uh, of the track, which houses any number of other functions. In this case, <clears throat> a two-story uh, building there. And this is exactly where the berm occurs uh, to the north side of the track that transitions you up to that upper field. So the building in this case sort of acts like that transition element from uh, lower field to upper field. In this case, in 2A, uh, this is a two-story building. Uh, cell tower service is consolidated to the east of that. Uh, still, we have visitors over here on the, um, on the Fairview Avenue side, so we've got uh, visitors' concessions and, uh, and toilets for those, for those folks on that side. And then north of the, uh, the stadium on what, again, is referred to as the upper field, <clears throat> this is showing both baseball and softball. Uh, baseball is now brought down to 
Uh, so its backstop is sort of in the southwest corner of that upper field, and softball is now positioned more so where baseball is. Uh, this is just trying to bring, just test fitting, what would it look like to bring both of those sports onto the site? And there's any number of uh, things about this that aren't actually so desirable, like baseball and softball often play at the same time, and so they wouldn't be able to do that. This would be a scheduling conflict. But it does show that there is a way to do it. This entire field would be uh, turfed with a synthetic turf to allow more playability uh, in this option. Um, and I think that, that pretty much captures this option. 2B, on the other hand, is just a small nuanced difference. And that difference is, I mentioned on 2A that the stadium would be new, and it is as well in 2B. Uh, 2A is just open air below that stadium. 2B now puts some content, it puts some uh, facilities below this. And as a result, this building in the north, north of the track becomes a one-story building. Other than that, those two options are exactly the same. Moving on to option three, <coughs> what you're going to see in option three and option four, uh, one major difference is in both of these options, it's contemplating the notion of uh, the school district acquiring these two parcels that are on uh, West Fifth Avenue and bringing those sort of into the fold of the property in the athletic complex just to see what this that additional property might uh, bring uh, as, as some additional amenities to the site. And so one of the things that might be obvious here is now both softball and baseball are on the same site, just like they were in the previous option, but there's no overlap now between those two fields. They're completely independent. They can play, into, you know, they can play games at the same time if they, if they wanted to. And there's some amenities that they might share, like a ticketing and concessions building and perhaps some restrooms there as well. But moving from the south to the north, a ceremonial plaza, a notion here, master plan notion of some, you know, where the victory bell might be, sort of this wall of champions, something that really begins to become, a, maybe uh, heralds some existing tradition, but maybe also starts to create some new traditions for the school. Brings a lot of facilities here along uh, North Star Avenue with new home side uh, bleachers, new buildings for uh, lockers, uh, concessions, public restrooms, and so forth. And then again, north of the stadium, softball and baseball, uh, track and field sports, uh, the cell tower building, and a, a, a ball field storage building out there that would help serve baseball and softball. One of the other things that this option does is if you're familiar with this site, you know there's a misalignment between where sort of Oakland turns into North Star right at West Third. And so this is aligning those intersections. I think this is something that has been talked about for a number of years. Uh, so this is just showing what the impact might be on the athletic complex site to do that. One of the other things that this is doing is since we're taking away some parking here on the south end, it's looking at doing some head in parking on North Star to create uh, some additional parking uh, for the site, or to compensate for parks and parking that's being taken away. And lastly, option four uh, is similar to option three, essentially from the midpoint of the site south, very similar. What's different about this one is uh, softball is, uh, is not on the site anymore, but in its place, uh, we brought tennis to its site. Now, the softball and tennis exist in Grandview on Park District property. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Uh, but this is looking at five tennis courts, as you know, currently on the Park District site, there are four, and five actually allows a little bit more competitive uh, events to be happening. Uh, but we are basically would be uh, adding tennis courts where you do have them in the community today. Other than that, this option is actually very similar to um, option three. And so in the workshop today, one of the things we tasked the group with, and we had a great group, very engaged, uh, probably 35 or 40 folks here today, uh, diff different constituents from coaches to uh, administrators to some community members, 
uh, look at all of these options and give us their thoughts and feedback on those. Uh, this next slide is essentially some of their you know, scribblings and, and notes and drawings over the tops of those drawings that we handed out to them. We had four teams, four small groups at the four tables that are in this room. And, and any number of common themes emerged uh, from those conversations, which I'd like to share on the next slide. So, um, things that seem to be really common. Uh, there was one of the things that was interesting, really, was the, uh, uh, how much commonality there was between the different options that the four different tables came up with. And we really started to try to summarize that so that we can capture that in our next step to to advance a number of options for the schools and for the athletic complex. But one, I'll just go through these. <clears throat> It was uh, the consensus in the room, anyway, with the group that was here today, to replace the home bleachers. I feel like the age of those, uh, there might there's better opportunities to reproportion those to maximize uh, uh, their use and what might go below those, and uh, maybe provide some other opportunities on the site that the current uh, stands, bleachers, concrete structure that's there does not do now. Um, <clears throat> New buildings uh, located to the north and south of the track was a common theme. And if I go back, I could probably point out if, uh, if you can zoom the camera in here. On this image, for instance, an idea of sort of this ceremonial building on the south side of the track, just, just opposite the high school. And then uh, some of our options that we shared did have this sort of radial building on the north side of the site. So booking, bookending the north and south end of the, uh, of the track with some type of buildings that um, would house, on this end, likely uh, ticketing, uh, visitors, uh, 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 concessions, uh, toilet rooms, and those types of things. And on the north end of the site, the idea was to put locker rooms in there so there's no conflict between teams that are playing, going to their locker rooms at, at halftime, and, and patrons who are trying to get to concessions uh, or, or restrooms. <clears throat> Um, we did look at options for both, as I mentioned, six and eight lane track. The consensus was six lane tracks, a six lane track uh, suits our needs. It's, it's serving us well, with the exception of that spur that I mentioned, which really should be to the north side of the track instead of to the south side of the track. So six lane track. Uh, visitor bleachers uh, should be separate from the home bleachers. One of the options that we looked at, a couple actually brought the visitors, consolidated them into the home side bleachers. Uh, it was felt that uh, just for crowd control, keeping the visitors on the on the other side, of, on the east side of the of the field, is, is just a better uh, route to go. Uh, it was felt that the upper field should be synthetic turf, uh, really to maximize the playability of that surface. Uh, it's not uncommon for uh, uh, natural turf for grass to start to get a little bit beat up uh, after after repeated use. And then the grounds folks say, let's not, let's not play on it for a while, especially after a hard rain. Uh, with the synthetic turf, that's just not an issue. Uh, lots of teams can play on it. And those fields get, do get a lot of use. Um, <coughs> it was decided there should be some consideration for acquiring those north parcels. Um, we had, I showed you options where it might, we might think about softball or tennis. One of the th ideas that floated up in the room today is we really have uh, tennis is well handled where it is, and the same thing is true for softball. Really nice accommodations today already. Let's think about a different use, and that different use that was put out there was a field house or sort of a multi-purpose type facility that maybe has, has a couple of gym type spaces. In <coughs> I just mentioned softball and tennis should remain where they are. Uh, security is an issue, uh, always is an issue. <coughs> So look at new fencing and new security lighting throughout the entire complex, not just on the, on the track side, on the stadium side, but also in the upper field. Parking, uh, there should be no reduction in any scheme uh, below the current parking levels. Uh, we, should, we should still investigate that North Star, Third Street intersection and provide options that do realign that uh, to make it a, a more of a continuous or more intuitive uh, path going north to south or south to north. 
And what, you know, what is the impact then, then on the campus? Uh, folks like the idea of this sort of new ceremonial entry off a of third opposite the high school. The high school has such a nice grand formal uh, facade that you know, sort of uh, uh, respecting that but reinforcing that on the opposite side of third was, was seen as a real benefit and something that could really add a, a lot of uh, a character to the site. And then finally, um, softball in a southwest orientation. So that sort of rotating south softball so it's, I'm sorry, baseball, to, uh, to, uh, it, to bring the, its backstop into that southwest corner of that north uh, upper field was seen as the route, the way to go. So that's really the sort of common threads that really uh, were on all of the schemes uh, here earlier today. And with that, um, just going back to the agenda, I think there will be lots of opportunities. Uh, Andy Call provided his email address earlier, uh, and I'm sure that he would welcome messages uh, or email directly to him. Andy, are there other means that you would want to provide? And with that, we're going to call it a wrap, and, and, and please invite you to our next meeting, uh, which will be here at the middle school in the library on July 19th at 6 p.m. We look forward to seeing you.